That was a long introduction. Thanks. That was, do you want to keep going? No, I'm good. I feel terrific now. Let's go have a drink. Um, so it's, it's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Justin stole my introduction, um, I was going to mention that although I am not a son of Williams College, I am a son-in-law. Um, my wife was indeed class of 98. We were indeed married in Thompson Memorial Chapel uh, just over 10 years ago. It seemed to be auspicious. Things have gone well. Still married. Four daughters, as he said. Um, I'm always reminded that I am a son-in-law of Williams College because uh, friends of my wife's keep getting married. And when they get married, the, the wedding is like all eefs. And then there's endless photos of different configurations of eefs, which are then sent into the alumni magazine. And then there are endless reunions of singing groups um, filled with eefs. And so it's, you know, I've, I've listened to a lot of impromptu Spring Streeter and Octet and Accidentals and just endless punning on eefs. The, E flats and euphoria and ecstasy and e pluribus unum and it's just it just endless it never ends. This is your future as I understand it, and someday you too will subject people who didn't go to Williams College to <laughs> endless Williams College nostalgia to the point where they will actually be excited to be invited to Williams College as I as I actually am. I om I almost feel like I belong, and it's really thrilling um, to be here. And I really want to thank Justin and also Jeff Israel for um, having pulled this together and, and made me feel so welcome already. So thank you, th and thank all of you um, for coming. I want to tell you the game plan. I'm going to talk for about half an hour about religion and American politics and why I think, as the title of my talk indicates, that religion doesn't really matter much in American politics anymore. And then I think we'll have about an equal amount of time for questions. Um, sound good? OK. So I'm going to begin with a question. I'm going to begin with a question before I say anything. And the, the first person to answer this question um, gets a free um, handshake after my talk. OK. Now, because I've been assured by my wife, as well as by US News and World Report, that you are a very smart bunch, I'm going to start with a quiz. With a show of hands, who here knows who Theodore James Kushner is? We have one semi hand right there. Do you want to try? Who is Theodore James Kushner? I know the Kushners are like an important Jewish family from New Jersey. The, the, including the governor of New Jersey? Mm, Chris Christie's the governor of New Jersey. <laughs> so you may remember him. For, uh, Justin, what are you teaching these kids in leadership studies? But, I'm but, a but, she is, but, but our friend here is the only one who even ventured an answer to this important question. And, you know, you've, 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 You've identified Kushner as a Jewish last name, so that's a start, okay? So, well done. Um, thank you for trying. No, th there are points for trying. Does anyone, now that you've had a moment to think about it, who is Theodore James Kushner? Does anyone know who Theodore James Kushner is? Theodore James Kushner is the grandson of Donald Trump. I mean, Trump. Um, he, what's more, he is the just recently born Jewish grandson of Donald Trump. In fact, he is the orthodox Jewish grandson of Donald Trump, born, of course, to uh, noted Jewess Ivanka Trump, uh, who converted to Judaism when she married the uh, wealthy and Jewish Jared Kushner, not of the Jersey Kushners, but in fact of the Manhattan Kushners. They are the even richer cousins to the Jersey Kushners. So uh, this is a very, very important person, and not only because little Theodore James um, Kushner, just shy of his first birthday, could be sleeping in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House uh, if the vo primary voters of New York and then the, the presidential voters of America have anything to say about it, right? So not only is, is his name important for that reason, but also because, as I'm going to explain, the existence of little Theodore James Kushner, um, grandson, Jewish grandson, orthodox Jewish grandson of Donald Trump, says something very, very interesting about American religious politics today. In some families, having a daughter leave the faith to convert to Judaism might be a big deal, except that in the case of the Trumps, whom we've all gotten to know so well, it's not clear that there's any family faith to leave. Trump seems to be something of a lapsed Presbyterian, maybe, we're not sure. He has attended Marble Collegiate Church in Manhattan, which is a Dutch Reformed church, which is kind of a cousin to the Presbyterians. The, the Presbyterians were Scottish Calvinists and the Dutch Reformed were Dutch Calvinists. Um, Marble Collegiate Church, which is in Midtown Manhattan, um, just south of, of, of uh, the library, was made famous by Norman Vincent Peale, 
who was the author of the great mid-20th century mega-selling book, The Power of Positive Thinking, which was sort of a guide to Christian living, but really it was more of a manual for business success. And in some ways, it was the, the book that started it all when it comes to motivational speaking and, dare I say, leadership studies. The idea that we can harness wisdom toward the kind of abstract idea of what it means to lead and to succeed really started in some ways with books like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, and then later with with books like Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. So Trump comes out of a tradition that's vaguely Christian, but really it's about Christianity as a guide to um, succeeding, to making money, to being happier. In that way, it's a grandfather to all of those late night televangelists who promise that if you just pray hard enough and just worship loudly enough, that you'll have great business success. Right? You, you know what I'm talking about. This, to put it simply, is not exactly the message of Jesus in the New Testament, if you read closely, but it is the message of a particular strain of American Christianity. And it seems that Trump, if he has any religiosity at all, um, hews to that particular strain. Of course, even within that, even within that tradition coming out of Norman Vincent Peale, Trump is not particularly pious. He does not seem to ever go to church. His rhetoric does not seem to be influenced by Christianity, and it's not at all clear that he knows anything about Christianity. Um, as for the other evidence that one might adduce that he's some sort of pious man or some sort of Christian or follower of Christ, you might look at how he lives his life. Um, is it pious? Um, does he have a reverence for the sanctity of human life and human relations? Does he live in honest reverence of other human beings, other creatures of God. Um, you could ask any of his three wives uh, if, if they feel that, <laughs> that that's the case. Um, it seems like there's not a strong argument that Donald Trump is particularly religious. In fact, as I say, it seems not to have phased anyone. And I think this is to his credit, right? It didn't phase anyone when his daughter went and became an Orthodox Jew, thus giving birth to little future Orthodox bar mitzvah boy Theodore James. Kushner will be quizzing you on the name at the end. Um, if in fact that's the case, if in fact the man who may today be coming very, very close, did he win the primary by the way? Do we know yet? It's not time yet. We don't know yet. But he may be very, very, very close to being the Republican nominee for president. If in fact it's the case that he is so irreligious, it, that his Christianity means so little to him, and he basically doesn't give a damn if little Theodore James Kushner ends up an Orthodox Jew, on the one hand, you can say, yay for pluralism, isn't America grand? But we could also say, how interesting for American electoral politics that somebody who's fundamentally irreligious seems to be so close to the White House. And yet, if we look at the other people running for president, it actually seems that maybe Donald Trump is not that exceptional. Historically, we've tended to elect fairly traditional mainline Protestants, Southern Baptists like Bill Clinton, um, Congregationalists, Episcopalians, like the first George Bush, things like that. But if you look at who's running this time around, it seems that something, while we weren't looking, really, really changed. It is true that Hillary Clinton is herself a daughter of the Methodist Church, but it would be difficult to argue that she has led a sort of traditional married life. It would be tr difficult to argue that the Clintons themselves embody the kind of staid moralistic family values that we expect of our mainline Protestant politicians. If you look at Bernie Sanders, what you have is a secular Jew, twice married, first to a Jew, then again to a Christian. And do you know which one of those two wives gave birth to his son? Who thinks it was the first? Got one person. Who thinks it was the second? Who thinks it was neither? Very good. The, the, the neithers have it. In fact, he has what used to be called a, a bastard son. He has an out-of-wedlock son, um, who I believe would be the first acknowledged out-of-wedlock son to ever sleep in the Lincoln bedroom, if in fact Bernie Sanders gets to the White House. Other presidents have in fact had out-of-wedlock children, as we know. But this would be the first one who's warmly embraced and owned by his, by his dad. Hillary Clinton, as we said, a Methodist, but also the wife of a well-known adulterer. And fourth, we have Ted Cruz, who was born Catholic, now attends a Southern Baptist church, but whose father, who speaks out on, him for, on his behalf a lot and who campaigns widely for him, seems to be some sort of post-denominational Pentecostal. That is to say, his father believes that you can anoint people with oil and bring blessings upon them. His father believes in prophecies. His father believes in speaking in tongues.
So Cruz is a very interesting kind of religious uh, mutt himself. And then if you look at the other candidates who have run for president lately in the last couple elections, you see other fairly atypical religious backgrounds, right? Ben Carson, a Seventh-day Adventist. Do we have any Seventh-day Adventists in the room? Yeah, I tend, I, you are? Oh, you're just kidding, okay, yeah. <laughs> I like the droll sense of humor. It's, it's, it's a little bit funny to, um, uh, when I, when I, when I, I, often begin, I often speak on Scientology, and when I give speeches on Scientology, I always begin by saying, do we have any Scientologists in the room? And then there's always a few jokesters whose hands go up. But then, of course, I have the lingering suspicion that maybe, in fact, they are Scientologists who have been spent to, sent to spy on me and see what I say about Scientology. Uh, ben Carson is a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know if any of you know anything about uh, Adventism. But, of course, it uh, began out of the Millerite movement in the 19th century who thought they could pr predict the day on which the world was going to end in 1844. And when the world didn't end on that day, they pushed the date back and they recalculated and they said, well, it's going to end on this date, but then it didn't end on that day, so they pushed it back again and they kept pushing it back. And let's say, just say that the Seventh-day Adventists have stopped predicting exactly when the world's going to end, but they know it's really, really soon, okay? That's Ben Carson's religiosity. Um, they also are for the most part, vegetarians, which is very interesting. I don't know if Carson himself is an Adventist vegetarian, but it's likely that he is, which I think would have made him the first vegetarian president. <laughs> Mitt Romney, the 2012 Republican candidate, as no doubt all of you here know, was what he would call a Latter-day Saint and what the rest of us would call a Mormon. So in short, when you pull the lens back a little bit, it seems like the days when Americans elected old line Episcopalians like Papa George Bush or Congregationalists like Barack Obama or even fairly typical garden variety evangelicals like George W. Bush, those days may seem to be over. Things are getting awfully weird, awfully weird. And yet, how could this be? Because for the past 40 years, starting when I, about the time I was born and definitely when I was in college about 20 years ago and, and down through the education that you're getting now, we've been told that there's this massive voting block in America made up of conservative Christians, right? All of us, no doubt, have heard something about the Christian right or conservative Christians. We're told that they exercise this enormous sway in the Republican primaries. We're told that you can't win certain southern states unless they're on your side. And these conservative Christians are Southern Baptists, some of them are Methodists, some of them are megachurch, um, non-denominational Bible church Christians, as they would call themselves. But they tend to believe in things like the sanctity of human life, as they would define it. So they, they, they would say they're against abortion. They would say uh, that they believe in a literal reading of the Bible or a mostly literal reading. They're, is variety on that. Um, they would say that they think that divorce is problematic. They would say that they think that um, sex out of wedlock is problematic. Right? We, we know the stereotype. We know what these conservative Christians believe. And yet, how is it that they seem unable of giving us a candidate or peopling the fields of presidential contenders with anyone who looks remotely like them? Right? I mean, Cruz would be the closest you would come, but again, even he was born Roman Catholic, and his father is a kind of uh, Christian that most of them would say that they're not. There is nobody right now in the current election cycle who fits the particular mold of just evangelical Protestant piety that we think that the conservative Christian right wants to give us. And in fact, in fact, when you look at polls of whom they are supporting in the current election cycle, Many of them show that conservative evangelicals are supporting the thrice-married, lapsed Presbyterian grandfather of Theodore James Kushner. Why on earth would they be supporting Donald Trump? It just doesn't make any sense according to the narrative that we know. To the extent that evangelicals had a candidate who looked like them, it was Marco Rubio, who very much presented himself as a clean-cut, Bible-believing son of... Yeah, Florida's not quite the Bible Belt. The northern part of Florida is the Bible Belt, okay? But even then, they couldn't save his candidacy at all, right? He, he really went down in flames fairly early in the process. And in fact, if you look at his narrative, he wasn't that typical and evangelical either. Uh, as I discovered a number of years ago when I was reporting on Marco Rubio, he was either Roman Catholic or evangelical depending on which audience he was speaking to. Now, why would this be? Marco Rubio, of course, is Cuban-American. And in the old line Cuban community of Miami, there's great reverence to this day for the Roman Catholic Church. So that meant that when he was trying to shore up the Cuban vote in Miami, 
He was all about his Roman Catholicism and all about his local parish church and the Catholic priest and the Pope. But when he wanted votes from the megachurch evangelicals who people so much of the rest of Florida, he would talk about how he goes to his wife's Bible church. So he was either Catholic or evangelical, and somehow neither side seemed to catch on that he was playing them for, for suckers when he was talking to the other side. Okay, So I would argue that, in fact, even Rubio is not a candidate who has ever seemed ideal to the Christian right. He was a fairly problematic candidate. By the way, Ted Cruz's dad, the Pentecostal Christian who supposedly is a Bible-believing, good family values guy, twice divorced. Okay. So what you see is a, is a field of candidates just littered with people who 50 years ago or 100 years ago would have been unacceptable to anything that you, we think of as the Christian right. So how does that work? How is it that we have this narrative where we have this very, very powerful conservative Christian coalition, and yet none of the candidates seem to reflect that, right? And, and yet it could be a Sanders-Trump competition in the end, or, or a, a Hillary versus Donald Trump competition. Something is begging for explanation here. Along the way, everything changed. Evangelicals today apparently will vote for Mormons. Mitt Romney got a majority of their vote, even though they believe that Mormonism is heresy. Right? They do not believe that Mormonism really constitutes Christianity, and yet they were perfectly willing to vote for him. It appears they will vote for Donald Trump. If evangelicals will vote for Mormons and Catholics will vote for Jews and everyone will vote for an adulterer and nobody cares about Bernie's out of wedlock son and nobody cares that Trump has no religion at all, what on earth happened? That's the question I want to answer in my remaining few minutes. The first thing I would say is that in America today, everybody seems to be in a mixed marriage. Now, by mixed marriage, I don't mean what we think of, which is somebody Christian who marries somebody Jewish uh, or somebody Muslim who marries somebody, hin somebody Hindu. There's a, there's a lot of that. Don't get me wrong, okay? But what I would argue is that in America today, even most Christian couples are in some sort of mixed marriage. Most people who grow up Methodist do not marry other Methodists, okay? Now, believe it or not, they used to. If you go back 50 or 75 years, and you were a young Southern Methodist, you would go to Duke University to find another Methodist. How many of you even knew that Duke was a Methodist school? We got one, got, got two or three here, yeah. What's, wh where would you go if you were Presbyterian? You'd, sorry? Princeton, Princeton was one place you would go, and if you didn't get in there, you'd go to Davidson. Okay, that was where, that was the, that, that was where you'd go if you were Presbyterian and didn't get into Princeton, right? And if you were Baptist, you might go to Brown, which probably very few people here knew is a historically Baptist school. Or you would go to Bates, okay? So these schools had denominational identities. The idea was that when you went off to find a spouse, you actually found someone who was within your denomination. So there was a much more rigid sense of what passed for acceptable religiously. These days, you know, even if you're a pretty serious Methodist, you'll make do with a Southern Baptist wife, and even if you're a pretty serious Southern Baptist, you'll make do with a Lutheran presidential candidate, as long as more or less you agree with them on various things. But the idea that you have a very tightly constricted idea of what constitutes the true religion and what constitutes apostasy or heresy, that idea has more or less uh, gone out the window. Uh, it wasn't always that way, as I said. Um, some of you will remember a very fine movie about fly fishing called A River Runs Through It. Uh, it's based on the great book by Norman MacLean, which no doubt is read somewhere in the, in the curriculum here. And uh, in the original book, I think it is, I can never remember if it's in the book or if they invented it for the movie, but it, it, it's, it's a good line nonetheless. Um, the children are, are sons of a Presbyterian minister, and their mother is a very, very rigid and sort of strict Scottish Presbyterian. And at one point, one of the sons comes home, and it turns out that he's, he's, he's squiring a new lady around, a new girl. And um, his mother wants to know what religion the, the, the young lady is. And it turns out that she's Methodist. And the mother's just horrified. I'm a Presbyterian woman, and her son is dating a Methodist. And she says, a Methodist? That's just a Baptist who's learned to read. <laughs> and it, it, it gives you a sense of how profound the sense of difference was, even within what we would think of as very, very similar Protestant denominations. But today, that sense of loyalty has simply dissipated to the point where almost everyone is in some sort of mixed marriage. By the way, I would even argue that two atheists or people who have no particular interest in religious belonging when they get married are often in a mixed marriage. Often one of them is a diehard rationalist 
hardcore atheist, and the other one is kind of spiritual and, you know, gets spirituality through walks in the woods or says that yoga brings him closer to God or something like that. You know, one of them's, one of them's a little more airy-fairy and non-committal about, uh, about atheism. Maybe there's a greater power somewhere. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are what I'm talking about. So, so that's the first thing, is even within an irreligious couple, there is a sense that it's a religious mixed marriage. So that has changed, and that has made people more tolerant of the kind of candidates they will accept in the public sphere. Okay, the second thing that's changed is that the group that supposedly cares the most about candidates' religion, evangelical Protestants, has in fact proven itself over the past 50 years to be kind of flexible about what it believes. So for example, in 1973, which you will know was the year that Roe v. Wade was decided in, in, in the Supreme Court, in 1973, the Southern Baptist Convention, which we think of as one of the most conservative evangelical bodies in the country, they passed a pro-choice resolution. They supported Roe v. Wade in 1973. Now, 11 years later, there was a conservative takeover of the convention's hierarchy, and the Southern Baptists moved to the right, and they rejected those pro-choice politics. But the truth is that what we think of as Christian conservatism has been very, very much in flux and was not as... Uh, it was not written the same way even just in the 1970s. Just to that point, in 1976, as between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, excuse me, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, the liberal candidate, got the majority of the evangelical vote. Now, in part, this is because he himself described himself as born again, which was not something that a candidate for high office had ever called himself before. Um, that was back when politicians weren't quite as public about their religion, but he called himself a born-again Christian, and evangelicals felt he was one of their own, even though he was politically liberal. So back then, the Christian coalition, such as it was, was actually supporting the liberal candidate. By the way, the evangelical vote again went to Bill Clinton um, in his first run at office. So the evangelical vote has often been willing to go to people who have an evangelical sensibility, even if their politics are liberal. It wasn't until 1980 when evangelicals united behind Ronald Reagan, that there was really this fusion that we come to think of as right-wing politics plus evangelical Christian activism. The 80s were the heyday of what we think of as the Christian right. You had organizations like Ralph Reed's Christian Coalition. You had the men's group known as the Promise Keepers. Probably very few of you remember the Promise Keepers, but they used to fill stadiums with men, no women allowed just men holding hands and weeping and confessing their sins, their adultery and their boozing and their drinking and their drugging and their whoring and promising that when they left the stadium, they would go back home to their wives, reborn, and be better men. Um, and I don't know what happened to the men, but I know what happened to the promise keepers, which is they don't seem to exist anymore. Um, they still have a website, but I've not heard of any, not heard of any promise keepers um, rallies. So this was in the 80s. There was this very, very strong fusion between what we think of as conservative or Republican politics and what we think of as Christian activism. How did that fusion happen about 1980, when only seven years earlier you'd had pro-choice Southern Baptists, and when a couple decades later you'd have Donald Trump? What was going on around 1980? And the answer is that for various reasons, evangelicals and conservative Catholics decided that they liked Ronald Reagan. Um, they had gotten to know him in the mid-70s. He had run a kind of outsider campaign for president in 1976. We'd, he had almost taken the nomination from Gerald Ford. And between about 76 and 80, evangelicals and conservative Christians in general decided we like this Reagan fellow. Um, now Reagan, of course, uh, was an interesting character, right? He had been a movie actor. He had been uh, president of the Screen Actors Guild, so he'd been a union man, but he had then moved very, very far to the right. He was a charismatic speaker. He'd been governor of California, where he had made his name by um, promising to quash hippie rebellions on the University of California campuses. So he was kind of a hero to the right. But there was a little bit of a problem, which was that Ronald Reagan was a divorcee. He'd been divorced. His first wife, Jane Wyman, was still out there. And if you were evangelical in 1980, you took a very, very dim view of divorce. If you wanted to be a major Southern Baptist preacher, if you want to have a really good church, like First Baptist Church of Nashville or Dallas in the Southern Baptist Convention in 1970 or 74 or 76, you probably were out of luck if you were on your second marriage, if the first marriage had ended in divorce. Divorce was seen, in some ways, divorce was a more of a uniting principle for conservative evangelicals than abortion. 
And yet, somehow by 1980, they had decided they wanted to support Ronald Reagan. So what happened? What happened was they got very, very flexible about their theology, and they just stopped preaching on divorce. Randall Balmer, who's a great historian of American religion who teaches up at Dartmouth, studied Christian magazines in the 1970s, and he found that in the early 70s there were numerous articles decrying the evils of divorce and how divorce was rending the American family and how too many preachers were getting uh, divorced and, and, and having to be cast out and too many children couldn't live with both their parents anymore because of divorce. And then as the 70s wore on, and especially with a turning point in the mid-70s, they kind of just stopped writing about it and they kind of stopped preaching about it to the point that by 1980, when they were ready to unite behind a divorcee as the Republican candidate for president, they had simply decided that rather than turn their backs on Ronald Reagan, they would turn their backs on their theology of divorce. It turned out that when push came to shove, their sense of what evangelical Christianity was was actually fairly flexible. So to sum up, where do we stand? Unlike 50 or 75 years ago, today most Americans are from families where they've learned some values of religious tolerance, or at least they've accepted the idea that their kids and their spouses and maybe even their political candidates are not going to represent them religiously, which is not something that Americans would have necessarily been comfortable with 75 or 100 years ago, but today it's the norm. And second, even those who do see themselves as being part of some coherent gnomic Christian right are not really so sure what that Christian right means. It's been in flux on issues like abortion, issues like divorce, issues like war, issues like torture. Um, the Christian right is actually far more flexible than we think it is. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a powerful right-wing voting bloc that has influence in politics and that has some overlap with church membership. Like the reality is that church membership still predicts for conservatism uh, more strongly than church non-membership does, right? They're, they're, who are we kidding? There is this fact on the ground in American life, and, and that's true. But at this point, it seems that the influence operates around the edges. That is, it's no longer excluding Mormons, it's no longer excluding Jews, it's no longer excluding Roman Catholics, it's no longer excluding the thrice married lapsed Presbyterian grandfathers of little boys named Theodore James Kushner, who will someday have a bar mitzvah. Where is it still operating? Where does that Christian right influence still, um, is it still to be reckoned with? Well, unquestionably, you would see it powerfully if we had a Muslim candidate for president, right? Unquestionably. Now, right now, as far as I know, there's still exactly one Muslim congressman and no more, right? Keith Ellison from Minnesota uh, is an African-American Muslim. If he were to try to become president, you would probably see a lot of the anti-Muslim animus coming out of certain conservative Christian churches. By the way, it would also come out of lots of people who are unchurched. This is not to say that Christians or any religious people have a monopoly on that kind of intolerance, but there is, we know in society, a Christian caste to a certain kind of anti-Muslim rhetoric, and you would see a rejuvenated uh, Christian right if we had a Muslim candidate. The other place where I think you would see it is if we had an avowedly atheist candidate. Polls consistently show that if you want to be president, it's probably best in terms of getting votes to be some sort of mainstream Christian, it's probably second best, uh, and that, that would include Roman Catholics, probably second best to be a Jew. Jews poll fairly favorably. It's probably third best, I would say, uh, to be from some sort of South Asian religion. Hindus tend to poll well. Um, far left nominally Christian traditions like Unitarianism or Quakerism, nobody knows what they are, so they poll fairly well. <laughs> Um, next down on the list, if you want to get votes, it's, you know, it's not helpful, but it won't destroy you in this day and age, according to polls, if you're a gay man or a lesbian. Um, you probably still have a shot at it, even if you're left-handed, although that may be seen as sinister by some. But absolutely dead last in terms of likability in polls of likely voters are atheists. And what's interesting is avowed atheists poll badly even among fellow atheists. There is this weird little thing where even people who are themselves atheists kind of want their commander in chief to talk about God bless the USA. It just sort of makes them feel, I don't know, it feels commander in chiefy to use Christian language. So I guess I would conclude by saying that even though having a particular religion doesn't matter as much as it once was, having some religion still does. Thank you very much.
So I have no idea how long I spoke, but I think I left time for some questions. And Dr. Professor Crow will tell us. Any questions? Yeah, we have a, you in the far back corner in the purple, and then we'll go to the woman right in front of you. Yeah. yeah, so I guess what would you say the difference is between, you know, an atheist and someone who's just not that religious? Like, is it good enough to say, I mean, apparently, to say, I like the little crackers, or to be someone like probably a lot of us and hope nobody asks you because you're really not sure? Do you mean, what's the difference in terms of likability as a candidate? Which would hurt more? Okay, so we actually, I mean, here's the truth. We've had atheists running for president. I mean, I feel fairly certain that Bernie Sanders is an atheist. Um, Dennis Kucinich, whom some of you will remember from, I guess, 12 years ago, uh, running for president was the last time he ran. Um, you know, he was nominally Catholic, but when I got him on the phone, I was a reporter back then for, for uh, I was doing a piece for a newspaper. Um, I mean, I'm still a reporter, but I was, I was doing a piece for a newspaper uh, at the Hartford Current. And I got Kucinich on the phone and I, I kind of pressed him like, well, you know, tell me, do you believe in God? And he was very, very vague. He said, well, I believe in some sort of greater truth in the universe. Okay, well, is the greater truth the crucified and resurrected Jesus of Catholicism that you say you believe in? Well, I, I take Jesus to be a uniquely inspira inspirational figure. Well, okay, was he divine? Well, it depends what you mean by divine. I think that a walk in nature is divine. I mean, you simply couldn't pin him down. And then finally you realize, he's, yeah, he's, he's an atheist. Um, but it was okay as long as he didn't come out and say it. Voters don't, there, there are a lot of voters who themselves are unsure about religion, but they think that atheists can't have morals and they don't want their children to be in a position of looking up to a commander in chief who says there's no God. In other words, while they themselves are undecided, they aren't sure how to raise their kids, they aren't sure what sort of message they want their kids to get, um, they're a little nervous that a Sunday school they send their kids to will be either too Jesus-y or not Jesus-y enough. They're filled with all this doubt and they don't want the president to tip the scale toward godlessness. So as long as the person running for president kind of is willing to live in that ambiguous, well, there's a greater divinity in the universe, fine. But if that person came out and said, yeah, there's no God, it would be over for her or him. So that's the difference for voters is they want plausible deniability. They want you to lie just enough so that you're not destroying their kids' potential faith. Great question, right in front of you, yeah. Do you see like the fact that you have people of these different faiths or you know, non-faiths running for president as like sufficient evidence that religion is no longer playing a huge role in politics? Because it seems like you can still have you know a religious right dictating a large portion of the Republican Party platform, and the fact that they don't choose as their standard bearer, like the average evangelical, whatever that looks, you right. know, who perhaps doesn't actually exist, like the Platonic form of right. whatever the evangelical is, and so. It seems like that isn't necessarily enough to say that evangelical Christianity is not still driving politics in a powerful way. So that's a great question. It's a great, a great distinction, a great challenge to, to, to my argument. I think that it drove it in a very powerful way for about 10 or 20 years in exactly the way you pointed out, which is it puts certain issues uh, beyond debate. So for example, the abortion question. Now, if you self-identify as a conservative Christian, um, especially one who also has conservative political leanings, you know what you, you're supposed to think about abortion. You don't, it's not one of the things you interrogate. Um, and uh, interestingly, the death penalty is also one of those. There was this fusion of a certain kind of pro-death penalty evangelicalism with Republican partyism that put the death penalty out of discussion for a lot of evangelicals. However, I think that was a temporal phenomenon where the Christian piece has receded and that's just now become Republican dogma. So it's not clear to me that the people who believe in that, it, let's say that you're, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal in stereotypes here just to make it easy, right? Let's say that you're a conservative Republican identified voter from Alabama. You may think, you may belong to the Southern Baptist Church and you may vote in the Republican primary, but I'm not sure that your being Southern Baptist has anything to do with it. In other words, your church membership might kind of drift off and lapse and you might get divorced and you might even knock up a girlfriend and then she gets an abortion but when you go to vote in that Republican primary, you're still a pro-life, pro-death penalty, pro-torture voter. Because at this point, it's become Republican dogma. 
However, why did abortion become Republican dogma in that way? Because of 10 or 20 years of severe pressure from a particular interest group. Here's the other complication is evangelicalism has fractured so much in the last few years. And I didn't talk about this in my talk, but a lot of the really, really committed evangelical ministers and seminarians and, and, and mission workers today actually have swung back towards a more progressive politics in some way. So for example, a substantial number of them are questioning the death penalty, are questioning torture, are questioning mass incarceration. Um, abortion still seems to have become just solidified as, you know, that the pro-life position is Christian and Republican dogma. But on those other issues, um, the Christian influence has actually diverged from Republican influence in some ways. So I think that it's just not, um, th there was a, a kind of uniformity of the two movements for a while there, and they've now diverged again, is what I think. Sir. Um, so where are we headed? Are the evangelicals going to be split between the two parties? Are the Republicans going to start uh, looking at these positions like the, the death penalty and abortion and uh, perhaps reconsidering them? Uh, what, what does this theory uh, say about the future? Yeah, I think, I think actually a lot of topics are up for grabs, right? So you actually have some conservative states that have put moratoria on the death penalty and where um, the idea that a Republican candidate must be pro-death penalty um, part of you know is no longer quite as certain. Part of that is there's just been such a drop in crime. I mean, what I, the, the trends I'm talking about in the 80s also coincided with the most murderous period in America um, in in the previous century. Although we'd been far more murderous in most of the 19th century, but you know, crime receded a lot. The emphasis on incarceration and the death penalty and being tough on crime uh, is now not as important to the Repub Republican Party as it once was. So I think that'll be up for grabs. Um, you definitely see war policy as being more up for grabs. I mean, there are definitely a lot of Christians who are now saying, like, you know, who've forgotten as 9-11 has receded, the idea that we must be in Iraq or must be in Afghanistan um, has receded a bit. So I think a lot more things are going to be up for grabs. Here's the other piece of that. The other piece is that religious identity is getting weirder and weirder in America. So the reality is that um, the Southern Baptist Convention, which was like the great success story of the second half of the 20th century in terms of just building a massive, unstoppable force of like conservative evangelical influence, um, actually for the first time in I think 100 years, made fewer baptisms two years ago than it had the year before. Like in 2015, they baptized fewer new people than they had in 2014 and their membership roles were slightly down. So. The, the big monoliths like the Roman Catholic Church and the Southern Baptist Convention are actually waning in influence, which means it's gonna be a lot more scattered, like in this community, a big mega church will, will have power. In this community, maybe it'll be a mosque because there are a lot of Muslim immigrants. In this community, it'll be a patchwork of Protestant churches. And in a lot of communities, especially like on the West Coast, it's nothing. I mean, Seattle, there are some very large churches, but in terms of their role in politics in some of, the, some of those big cities, it's almost nil. Manhattan. There, there's not really a religious influence in Manhattan politics, except in certain churches in the black or Latino communities at the very, very local, like city council type level. But running for, you know, Trump did not need to go pay fealty to all sorts of New York, New York City religious figures in the way that he would have 50 years ago. So I just think all of these things are more up for grabs. Um, Ma'am, in the back. So I'm curious to see what your thoughts are in regards to the religious leaders. Like if you look at Pope Francis, he's the first Jesuit and he has a lot of influence in regards to how Catholics view a lot of the points that are up for contest against like the politicians. So I'm curious to see like what your thoughts are in regards to the impact that they can have on voters. Because we do have a very strong like Catholic group of Americans who will listen to what the Pope says. You know, you raise a great question when you mention Pope Francis. I mean, Pope Francis is, of course, like what religion journalists and scholars spend all of our time thinking about. Like, we wake up thinking of Pope Francis, and we go to sleep thinking of Pope Francis. And it doesn't matter if we're Jews, Gentiles, Muslims, Mormon. Like, Pope Francis is what we think about. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been the great story of the past few years for us, as you correctly identify. Um, Here is the thing, though. Um, you know, Pope Francis is enormously influential in terms of the public, non-Catholic perception of the Catholic Church. That is to say, I, as a sort of stereotypical liberal Jew, am genetically engineered to love Pope Francis. <laughs> okay. You know who else is genetically engineered to love Pope Francis? All of the Catholics who haven't been going to church for the past 50 years. They love Pope Francis, right? Um, the people who have actually been going to church in the Catholic Church, 
Some of them love Pope Francis and some don't. So he's a very, very influential world figure. He's very influential on the worldwide stage and the American stage. Um, it's not at all clear how much influence he'll have in the Catholic Church because here's the thing you have to remember. You know, over 90% of American Roman Catholics disregard what the church teaches on everything anyway. I mean, Roman Catholics practice birth control at over 90, some say 95% uh, rate. Um, they tend to uh, be pro-choice at a higher level than evangelical Protestants. Roman Catholics are reasonably pro-choice. So Roman Catholics have been essentially treating the Pope's, um, uh, the Pope's statements and positions with a kind of like gentle wink and a nod, and then they go out and ignore them anyway. So here, but here's the question that we really have to see, which is, will Pope Francis's influence and his popularity bring Catholics back into congregational life? If he actually ends up filling pews with people who were disaffected, then those particular parishes and dioceses may end up being really, really interesting, funky places that end up having influence politically on a local level and being active and kind of mattering. But it has to be a result of people coming back into the pews. It can't just be a result of people digging his public persona. And I think it's, the, the evidence isn't really in yet on whether there are actual Catholics who are like, yeah, I left the Catholic Church years ago because of its position on birth control or abortion or whatever, but now, because of Francis, I'm back. I actually haven't met many Catholics like that. And the sociological research is still too early to tell. So. Yes? Uh, I'm wondering to what extent is the flexibility that you talked about uh, in the evangelical belief in the 80s that arises, what, to what extent is that a result of, I guess, the reframing of evangelical religious doctrine towards, I guess, in doctrine of absolute forgiveness, and which allowed someone like a Ronald Reagan to capture that vote? And then the doctrine that comes forward that we see pushed forward by evangelicals in the 80s, to what extent is that dictated more by Republican political elites once they've captured that vote? Yeah, I mean, you, you've identified two really powerful dynamics. One is that there is this, I, I will call it a paradox, though evangelical theologians would say it's entirely consistent, right? But there is this paradox of sort of great moralism in terms of behavior, but great emphasis on forgiving people who don't live up to those behaviors. Right? So it is entirely possible, as long as you seek forgiveness, to be somebody who sins and then is forgiven and then sins again and then is forgiven and sins again. I mean, you know, it was not a problem for evangelicals in Louisiana to reelect Senator David Vitter even after he was caught spending his money on whores. I mean, this, you see this play out again and again in the evangelical world because they, like many Americans, love a forgiveness story. So yes, I think you've identified something very powerful, which is that um, there was always a kind of inherent... Um, that the evangelical doctrines always inherently undercut themselves because unlike Roman Catholics who will excommunicate you if you screw up in certain ways, evangelicals are always excited for the day when they can welcome you back in um, and forgive you. The other thing you identify correctly is that once the synergy with the Republican Party occurred, sometimes particular positions were driven more by Republican ideology and Republican needs than by evangelical ideology. So, for example, there was nothing in, say, 1950 or 1960 that was particularly evangelical about free market capitalism. Although there's been a lot of good recent scholarship that shows how free market capitalists began trying to plant the seeds of their beliefs in evangelical communities. It was very, very cynical. There were some, some free market capitalist ideologues who felt if we can capture the evangelicals, they will become our army. And there is a way in which that happened. I mean, any plain reading of the New Testament, it's very hard to divine a political economy from it, but if you're going, if you're going to, it's certainly much more of a socialist political economy than a free market one. So the idea that we, be, we came to identify uh, conservative Christians with a free market economy is, is highly contingent and it was very much driven much more by free marketeers than, than by Christians, I think. Um, yes, sir. So uh, two unrelated things, but uh, the first is that um, you made sort of a sociological argument about how it used to be with religious people seeking out someone of the same religion, and then you made this, uh, to marry, and then you made this leap to, uh, and this could influence votes. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's almost certainly the case that overwhelmingly religious people who did that in their personal lives voted for people not of their religion 50 plus years ago. So I mean, think about all the Catholics who happily voted for non-Catholic candidates when it was scandalous to have Al Smith or, or uh, Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, I wonder, um, you know, about the the um, evidence that connects how people choose to live their lives to their political behavior. Um, how 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 you pull that through, and then. In a more recent, I guess I would ask, um, Bob Putnam and Dave Campbell did these uh, surveys, um, 2006, 2007, and 2011, about religion and society, a bunch mm -hmm. of things. And one of the things that they found is that the thing that unified the Tea Party movement was their desire for religion to play a bigger role in politics. So they said a whole bunch of other things. The, the elites dominating the Tea Party said, oh, we want to cut the budget, da da da, da. But what really motivates Tea Party voters is sort of the opposite view that you're taking. That not that a particular religion necessarily, I think they would want it to be their religion, but that they think public life, political life, should be more religious in the United States. And that seems like an important... Right. Well, I mean... Let me take the second one first and say, there is no question in my mind that if you ask large swaths of voters, not just Tea Party voters, but really any community that, again, broadly speaking, is center-right, and even many that are center-left, right, should religion play more of a role in politics, they will say yes, overwhelmingly. I mean, that, that, is, that is a consistent belief that you find among um, you know, large swaths of, of working class conservative white communities, almost all minority communities, for example. I mean, that is one of the things you say to basically show that you're American. That's where we become, because we want our politicians to say in, you know, God bless America, we want our money to say in God we trust. Religiosity is seen as a sign of good faith and, and kind of moral probity. So the question, you'd really have to go deeper, and I saw some of those polls. I mean, I know that everyone's always trying to figure out, like, what is the Tea Party more than anything? Um, and, but what's interesting is a lot of those people are Donald Trump voters, right? And, and what they're looking for, I think, I mean, my read on a lot of that sociological data, a lot of which I you know, have looked at, is that a lot of what they say they support is coded language for a broader notion of purity, right? So believe, in other words, one of the things you might say if what you want is more purity is a, is, is a sense of reversing decline and returning to a kind of truer um, kind of pa utopia in the past. One of the things you would say is I want more religion in politics because the perception is we used to have a kind of unified religiosity in politics. Other things you would say are I want fewer immigrants because we used to feel whiter. You know, other things you might say are I want more women working in the home because we used to have a more patriarchal structure and that brought stability. So I think there are a lot of things that are code for a kind of retrograde, backwards looking utopianism. But then what do you make of the fact that so many of them are willing to support someone who doesn't seem to be religious at all on the most superficial evidence? So I, I, think, I think what you're saying is unquestionably true, but I just think there are really serious problems for it. And what's more, they didn't, although they were certainly a role in all sorts of congressional uh, campaigns and elections, uh, you know, especially four and six years ago, um, they don't seem to have been able to organize into any sort of persuasive voting bloc nationwide when it comes to, you know, wider spread politics. And what's more, they seem to be on the decline. I mean, certainly their organizations are. Now, you could say that's because of sort of anomic libertarian impulses within them that make it hard for them to organize. But, um, but I do wonder if we overstated their influence nationwide to begin with. Th that's my take on that. Um, the other question you asked, you know, weren't there always people who liked a certain kind of religious coherence in their private and domestic lives, but then we're happy to vote for candidates outside it. Absolutely, absolutely. There's no one-to-one -one causation there. However, we know from sermon evidence, for example, that preachers 100 years ago also felt very comfortable telling um, Calvinists, don't, Calvinist Protestants, don't vote for that non-Calvinist on election day. And Protestant preachers felt very comfortable not supporting Roman Catholics. I mean, we know that from the Al Smith election and even the Kennedy election. So there used to be, all the trend lines show, I think, that there used to be a far greater sense that the lived purity and, and sort of coherence of your personal religious life was reasonable voting grounds or re the kind of thing you would take into account when appraising the character of someone for public life. I mean, what's so interesting is there was almost, uh, and the Mormon example is, of course, the great test case, right? Because Mormonism used to be perceived by evangelicals as a nefarious cult, okay? There is no question but that most evangelical pastors 40 and 60 years ago, and we know this because Mitt Romney's father, when he ran for president, was hit with this stuff when George Romney ran for president in 68, evangelical pastors had no compunction about saying that the Mormons were a nefarious, poly, you know, polygamous, uh, you know, satanic cult. 
And then you see Romney capturing, by a good margin, the evangelical vote a few years ago. So I think just the general trend lines show that, that something is, has shifted there. Maybe two more questions, do you think? Yeah, sure. OK. Yes, in the plaid. really can't be elected because people think like they're inherently amoral. So that, that's my guess. We don't know why they won't vote for atheists, but we know that the people who say they're willing to vote for an atheist are very, very small. Uh, well, regardless, I guess I suppose I wonder if someone like, let's say, Bernie Sanders, even Donald Trump, who is not particularly religious, like could the fact that they kind of both seem to have like very deeply felt like moral structures mm -hmm. independently, like very independent of a religious, I guess particularly Bernie Sanders, like independent of kind of a religious structure, like could that be helping them in some way? I mean, I, I think so. I think that's very shrewd that one of the things that substitutes for religiosity in our public perception of them is they are people of deep moral conviction. They are people who believe in a right and wrong. They're not relativists. Um, at the same time, that almost proves too much because everyone who runs for office talks in that way, right? I mean, everyone who runs for office runs on these platforms of here's what's right and here's what's wrong and here are the five things that are going to fix it and if we break up the banks that'll fix it or if we put God back in schools that'll fix it. Like, that's almost in the nature of being a politician. So we still don't know what would happen if someone with a very strong sense of right or wrong and a very kind of aggressive, uh, overdetermined program like a Sanders or a Trump also said, and by the way, it's pretty obvious there's no God. This is the only life we have and we got to make the most of it. So let's break up the banks. I mean, we... We don't know how that would play. Nobody's going to try it in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. There have been, set, I want to say, two or three openly atheist Congress people. Pete Stark from California was one. And then he, law, or he retired. And then in the most recent election cycle, there was another one. I think it might be the woman from Hawaii who is ancestrally Hindu, um, but I think says that she's an atheist. And I'm forgetting her name. Um, but like, at no time have there been two atheist Congress people which tells you something. And when they, get, when they do get elected, they get elected from very liberal and progressive and you know, kind of off the left end districts. So it's not something anyone's gonna try. And look, we are now at the point where we're electing queer Congress people and not yet queer atheist Congress. The atheism would be a much bigger drag on your candidacy. So the answer is we don't know, but everyone is so afraid of the, um, if they say, and by the way, I don't believe in God, or even some version of that, they were so afraid of the 30 second ad spot that would be out the next day on the air with them saying, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, right? It would be the, it would be the GIF that would keep playing, <laughs> right? And I think they feel that would doom them. Yeah. If religion no longer occupies sort of like the sacred space within American politics, do you think that something has usurped it? Or do you think that that has will be changing? I, you know, I'm thinking back to Trump, and he's obviously, you know, offended and marginalized the obvious groups, you know, Muslim, Mexican, women, et cetera, but also like veterans, the disabled, like, you know, categories that I think would have also been within sort of sacred cow of things that you don't, you don't really denigrate in yeah. American politics. So do you think anything is occupying I mean, that? I'm going to offer a fairly unhelpful answer, which is that I tend to think that, that you, you ever see those studies that show that the taller candidate always wins or that, you know, the candidate who, you know, pronounces... Uh, you know, rather instead of rather, or you know, ketchup instead of catsup. Or I mean, there's all, there's all those political scientists do this stuff. I'm always very persuaded by that stuff. I mean, I think the reason that people vote, I mean, you know, there's some obvious things like you need a good ground game, right? Like at, on election day, you still have to remind most people that it's election day because most people don't pay attention until the last week, right? So there's some obvious things in terms of organization and structure and running a shrewd campaign, but that that are that are ne necessary. But beyond that, I actually think it's very odd that the same country that you know, will elect George W. Bush will then pivot to Barack Obama. I, I think it's almost inexplicable. I think it has a lot to do with charisma. I mean, there are those studies that show that people will vote for candidates who have double consonants in their name because it, you know, it looks trustworthy. So you know, the, the great example being the former New Hampshire Senator Judd Gregg with, with a double D and a double G, and everyone just loved that. I'm very persuaded that there's weird stuff going on in how people vote that we just don't understand. Now, that's easy for me to believe because I'm kind of a religionist and I'm not a political scientist, so I never have to quantify anything. But I don't necessarily think that something else has moved in um, to replace it, except that right now, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment in, in the Republican Party certainly seems to be the order of the day. The people who've tried to win votes with a kind of more broad tent, slightly more pro-immigrant position have paid fairly dearly for it. It was one of, being slightly in that camp helped do in Rubio, for example. One more? Sure. Who's our last? In the back. Uh, 
I thought George Romney and how being a big Mormon hurt him. Yet Richard Nixon won, and he was a Quaker, which was barely a Christian, the same way that Mormons are. You thought about that? Sure. That's. I I would love to end on that because Quakers are one of my favorite topics. Um, so the gentleman asked, you know, we elected a, we, we refused to elect a Mormon candidate and he paid dearly for it, but then we pivoted and elected um, a, a Quaker. And um, this has to do, this actually illustrates several things going on in American politics. The first is that most Americans are religiously illiterate, even within their own tradition. So I have talked to people who are studying for the Lutheran ministry, who if I say to them in their first year of classes, what do you believe that's different from what Methodists believe, can't answer the question. Um, and that's true, I've talked to people, I talked to a, a woman who was in the church, the Nazarene, and wanted to be a mission worker, and I said, why are you a Nazarene Christian and not, say, an Assemblies of God Christian? She said, I don't, because I grew up in it. And this was somebody who wanted to spread the gospel of her church. Most Americans, even within their own tradition, are woefully ignorant. So Mormonism has a particular stink in America for a lot of people. Like, Mormonism, especially in the 1960s, we're going back a number of years, right, was almost unique in the way that I would say Scientology is today. Now that's, that's greatly reductionist. There are vast differences, not least that there are very few Scientologists, okay? Despite what the Church of Scientology would claim, it's really hard to find a Scientologist, um, except, you know, on your movie screen. So, um, but Mormonism was pretty unique. You could be almost anything else, and as long as you presented as a sort of upright religious individual, you were probably fine. Anything else Christian in 19... 68. You could be Lutheran, you could be Presbyterian, you could be Episcopalian. Now, you might say, well, weren't Quakers known as the sort of pacifists that you, you know, the hippie pacifists? Um, the answer is, well, a little bit, but of course Nixon, um, well, Nixon ran as the anti-war candidate, right? He was going to get us out of Vietnam. So that was a moment when it was kind of okay to be a little bit on the pacifist side. The bigger and more important answer is, it is a fairly recent phenomenon that most Quakers identify as pacifist. It's actually one of the great myths of American religion is that Quakerism equals pacifism. Um, it is true that there has always been a strong pacifist strain in Quakerism going all the way back to its founding with George Fox. But there have also always been, um, for one thing, Christian identified Quakers have been the rule through most of Quaker history. So the idea that it's some sort of post-denominational lefty Sunday morning, you know, coffee brunch where you listen to NPR together is a very contemporary idea. Like Quakerism used to be very Christian, um, especially around uh, Whittier College where Nixon, he grew up around there and went there and that had a very Christian flavor. The other thing is there have always been non-pacifist Quakers um, and there are to this day. And the image that we have of Quakerism as the, you know, the gentle religion that we can all run to when we flee the repressive upbringing of the religion that we were raised in is fairly recent and it's, no, it's by no means ubiquitous. So he had large bases of support from people who also knew a fairly different um, Quakerism. But the bottom line, of course, is the reason it didn't matter is because while Mormonism, as I said, uniquely had a kind of taint to it, um, nothing else, including Quakerism, even uh, came close. So I shall stop there, and thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it.